51. The Civil Revolution, Part 9. Natural law theories have been basic to the civil revolution. The concept of natural law has been very appealing to many scholars over the generations. Whereas God's law is written and not subject to change, natural law is known through reason, and this gives the scholar an opportunity to become the source of the law because he is ostensibly the voice of reason. We are told that scripture is not precise and is subject to varying interpretations, but how can we call precise a law known only to scholarly reason and imprecise at every point? Natural law transfers legislation from God to man and, in particular, to statist man. It is an instrument of relativism and closely related to positivism in law because it is a simple association of reason and the law with the sovereign state. The great revolution in the intellectual realm which preceded the civil revolution was the development of the myth of nature. This, in Western thought, was the undermining of Christendom. While this intellectual revolution came through the auspices of the Roman Church, it has also proven to be its major source of troubles in that it created a civil revolution which steadily severed its dependence on Revelation and the Church. In my study of The Mythology of Science, 1967, I dealt with the erroneous and dangerous concepts of nature. A created universe exists because of God's act of creation. The doctrine of nature assumed this universe to be a self-enclosed and self-contained system of causality with its own laws. A unity and self-being, an aseity, is posited and assumed as a fact without any evidence. This doctrine was an aspect of Hellenic religion and philosophy, and it is the religious presupposition of the modern age. Geoffrey Coziol saw behind this intellectual revolution changing perceptions of the world. He noted, as nature came to be recognised as a substantive reality possessed of its own equilibrium and ordinarily functioning without divine or human intervention, the positing of laws of nature followed necessarily. Coziol is right. Once nature was seen as in and of itself a substantive reality, it followed necessarily that nature was seen as the source of law. Prior to the development of the concept of immutable natural laws, law was seen as the expression of the sovereign person, God. In medieval life, it was an expression of lordship. It was personal, whether in God or in man. In the acclamation of medieval rulers, we see lordship on earth made subordinate to lordship in heaven, personal in both spheres. According to Kantorowicz, the Laudes invoke the conquering God, Christ the victor, ruler and commander, and acclaim in him, with him or through him, his imperial or royal vicars on earth, along with all the other powers conquering ruling, commanding and safeguarding the other order of this present world. The Pope and the bishops, the ruler's house, the clergy, the princes, the judges and the army. The correlation of the two worlds, the present and the transcendental and the dissolving of the one in the other, became manifest on closer inspection of the text of this chant. We can differ with the medieval concept of the connection between heaven and earth, but we cannot, as Christians, question the premise that the source of law is God. The early medieval view of God as the source of justice had its weaknesses, but the source of law was still God, not man, and to some kings such as William Rufus, this was wrong. He complained on one occasion, What's that? Is God a just judge? 
damn whoever thinks it. He will answer for this by my good judgment and not by God's, which can be folded this way and that as anyone wants it. By the 15th century, scholars like Gabriel Beale had connected right reason with natural law. Thomas Aquinas had already laid the Aristotelian foundations for this and spoken of natural law as the participation of the eternal law in the natural creature. The association of natural law with right reason was the foundation of elitism. It meant that the intellect, the scholar as the voice of right reason, was logically the source of true law and planning or predestination. Plato's philosopher kings were, as a result, a social necessity. The word of man was neither ruling word, the law word. According to John H. Geekern, both natural law thinking as found in Cicero and as expressed in Giovanni Boccaccio's De Cameron is basic to Machiavelli's thinking. Boccaccio gives a grim report on the plague in Florence and then a justification of flight from family and friends to preserve one's health. Dear my ladies, you may, like myself, have many times heard that whose honesty useth his rights doth no wrong, and it is the natural right of everyone who is born here below to succour, keep and defend his own life as best he may. And in so far as this allowed that it hath happened, while that, for the preservation thereof, men have been slain without any fault. If this much be conceded of the laws which have in view the well-being of all mortals, how much more is it lawful for us that whatsoever other, without offence unto any, to take such means as we may for the preservation of our lives? We have here the language of rights and natural rights. Man's duty to God has been replaced by man's duty to himself. Niccolo Machiavelli gave precedence to the health of the country over questions of justice or injustice, humanity or cruelty, or anything else. As Max Lerner noted, Machiavelli sought to distinguish the realm of what ought to be and the realm of what is. He rejected the first for the second. But there is a third realm, the realm of what can be. It is in that realm that what one might call a humanistic realism can lie. Nature as a substantive reality and as the source of its own laws was increasingly seen as conferring natural rights on individuals and also on civil governments. The one aspect led to laissez-faire and libertarian thinking and the other to statism. Law and dominion had been transferred to man. Boccaccio's perspective on law and nature has not received the attention it deserves because, in popular form, it gave expression to the new thought there is a cynicism regarding virtue. By Christ and his faith, and I should know what I say when I swear thus, I have not a single gossip who went a maid to her husband, and as for the wives, I know full well how many and what tricks they play with their husbands. And this blockhead would teach me to know women as if I had been born yesterday. Sexual sins are natural, not wrong. As one man says, My sin was one which still goeth hand in hand with youth and which on you would do away, if behoveth you first do away with youth. Boccaccio affirmed the equality of all men, first citing God and then turning to nature for his verification. But now let us leave this and look somewhat in the first principles of things, whereby thou wilt see that we all get our flesh from one same stock and that all souls were by one same creator created with equal faculties, equal powers and equal virtues. Worth it was that first distinguish between us who are all and still are born equal, 
Wherefore, those who had and used the greatest sum thereof were called noble, and the rest abode not noble. And albeit contrary usance hath since obscured this primary law, yet is it nowise done away nor blotted out from nature and good manners? Wherefore, he who doth worthily manifestly showeth himself a gentleman, and if any call him otherwise, not he who is called, but he who calleth committed default. The primary law is no longer to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or justice, but it is rather the equality of man. The golden rule is parodied to read, Whoso doth it to you, do you it to him. It is altered to read as a law of vengeance. God's law is set aside and we are told, But as I am assured you know, laws should be common to all and made with the consent of those whom they concern. These are the, quote, democratic, end quote, sentiments, but Boccaccio's was an age of tyranny. God's law, having been replaced by the will and law of man, it was not government and law by the consent of all which prevailed, but the will of tyrants. Boccaccio, 1313-1375, gave expression to these sentiments. But Cesare Borgia, 1475 or 1476-1507, demonstrated that, without the restraints of God's law in a society, the law and power of man prevails. The Renaissance gave birth to a humanistic faith and to tyranny. The two go together. Law derived from man or from nature is no restraint. Those who give the law see themselves as above it. The association of right reason with natural law leads to elitism. Elitism logically leads men to play God. Thomas Jefferson, the great, quote, Democrat, end quote, in a letter to John Adams on October the 28th, 1813, affirmed his belief in the contemptible nature of the conai of the cities of Europe and of the mobs of the cities. His basis for judgment was not sin, not the violations of God's law, but the difference between the elite and the herd. Sex has its purpose, Jefferson held, not pleasure, but the perpetuation of the species. As in animal husbandry, sexual coition should be for the improvement of the species, the goal should be a race of aristocrats, a natural aristocracy of men like Jefferson. If nature is ultimate as a substantive reality, then there is no reason why eugenic ideas should not prevail, nor abortion and euthanasia not be legalised. Red China has limited children to one per family. We are not told if this law applies to the elite leaders. The American Bar Association Section on Family Law has come out with a strongly favourable report on licensing parents and limiting parenthood in the US. We misunderstand these events if we fail to see them as modern efforts to rebuild the Tower of Babel, the one world humanistic order. In that instance, God observed, Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Genesis chapter 1 verse 6 Now as then, God brings confusion on such an anti-God dream and confounds it radically. The Babels of this world shall not and cannot stand. The civil revolution is a dream of a new Tower of Babel.